Welcome to the Traveling Sock Knitter Podcast. My name is Hannah. I am also known as Hanala on Ravelry, and I am known as HP Belwar on Instagram and Twitter. Today is... Is it actually July 7th? Yeah. All right, today is Tuesday, July 7th, 2015, and this is episode 82, Addicted to Crochet Hexagons. <laughs> Today's segments include drafting, fully drafted, lit review, summer reading, and noteworthy. So pull out your knitting. Uh... Let's knit together, except I'm not sure we're really going to knit together because I'm not really working on any vanilla socks this week, although I guess I could have brought in the ones that I was working on last week. Lilith has already come and gone. Um, so I'll show you what I'm working on, and then perhaps I will knit on this because it is just garter stitch uh, with one increase and one decrease on one row. Um, my first project, I cast on a lot of stuff <laughs> since we last met, uh, is Lily Pilly. Uh, this is a shawl, and I saw Leslie knitting this, uh, Leslie of the Knit Girls knitting this shawl, and immediately decided I must cast it on because I love it. Uh, so Lily Pilly by Amba. I'm using Sanguine Griffin Bugga, surprisingly. It's not surprising at all. <laughs> this is actually a Bugga episode. Um... I love Bugga, and it is one of my favorite yarns to use for shawls, so, and the colors just work together so wonderfully for this particular shawl. So I'm using Sanguine Griffin Bugga in the colorways Love Bug and Gray Scalloped Bar Butterfly, at least those are the two colors for the stripy part, which is so very wrinkled from being in the bag. But this is the stripey part that I have done so far. Um, and you do 50 rows of stripey, and I'm somewhere around 30. So um, 50 rows of the stripey part before you get to the lace. So I'm using these two colors for the stripey part, this gray and this purple pink. And then the yellow, which is... Uh, goldenrod spider and is looking much well I mean it's kind of a gold yellow but it's looking kind of greener than it really is um, on camera anyway uh, goldenrod spider will be the third color for the lace um, this pattern is just so cool it does the stripey part and then a solid section of lace and then more stripey and then a little bit more lace um, so I am very much in love with it and really enjoying knitting it. Um, it is in my bird leg bags, um, neon cat bag with the neon cats on the outside and the rainbow on the inside um, and the rainbow on the end here <laughs> on the zipper pull. Um, and I love this bag. So perhaps I will knit on this a little bit with you today. Not right at this moment, though. Now, Lilith had to go to the vet today, so she is especially needy. So I expect she will jump up and down from my lap several times today. Um, and she is getting... <laughs> she is. We are getting kittens. <laughs> and she's going to hate them. <laughs> But I might have kittens next time I record. Um, I don't know how easy or hard it will be to show you the kittens at that time, but we shall see. So we're going to go from a one cat family to a three cat family. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll save that story for noteworthy. Let me finish up what I'm doing here, which is telling you the size of this needle. It's a 4.0 millimeter size 6 needle. The pattern called for a size 5, but 6 was the only thing I had close to that that didn't have anything on it. <laughs> so I went with the, the 6 instead, and Bugga is um, sport weight rather than fingering, so I figured the 6 would be fine. Um, I hope I don't run out of yarn. 
Um, these skeins are 412 yards a piece and the pattern calls for 420 per colorway. However, I think that um, typically the skeins are a little over, so I don't think it'll be an issue. I did save all three of the tags. Love bug. So it's a 70% superwash merino, 20% cashmere, 10% nylon. Uh, gray scallop bar butterfly and goldenrod crab spider. Did I just say goldenrod spider? That's wrong. It's goldenrod crab spider. So, Bugga is what I'm using for actually both of the things that I cast on. So, the second thing that I am actually crocheting and not knitting is. I decided to do blanket hexes. Um, I, I was doing hexapuffs in Bugga once upon a time and I kind of lost steam on the hexapuffs and I don't know if I'll finish them, but I decided I wanted to crochet hexes. I don't know. <laughs> don't ask me because I don't know, but I am really enjoying <laughs> crocheting these hexes. So I'm making the uh, Crochet Along Baby Blanket by Lisa Richardson. Um, I don't know if I'll make baby blanket or if I'll make more hexes and make it a, a full-size blanket. Um, I am using a 3.75 millimeter Addy Swing Crochet Hook. And this is what that hook looks like. Um, and here it is, Addy 3.75, so you don't forget how big it is. Um, it has this kind of, it's plastic here, and it's just like really nice to crochet with. I really like how big this part is, uh, but the hook itself is metal, but the whole thing is this part that you hold is plastic, so it just feels a lot better in my hand than metal does. Metal is a lot harder on my hands. Um, this is nice to my carpal tunneled hands. Alright, uh, I went a little crazy and I crocheted 15 hexagons in four days, so... I don't know what to tell you about that. I will say they're in my absolute wonder bag. Um, that once held spinning, so there's stray fiber everywhere. Uh, it has this gorgeous purple on the inside. And uh, basically in the bag, I'm just keeping the crocheted hexes and I'm keeping the little ends and the little labels. And I've made so many of these. Originally, I was gonna tell you what colors I did and I made so many of these, I don't even know if I will know what colors match up with which little, little label. <laughs> Maybe I should have kept them around the little bits and bobs. These are the little ends of what I had left of yarn after I made the hex. So they do take very close to 10 grams of bugger to make each hex, um, which is fantastic because about 10 grams of bugger is about 30 meters of yarn, and so I know how much I'm using for stash dash. <laughs> so that is great. Um, all right, so let me show you. There is a hex in Tulip Tree Beauty. And that's this one here. Um, here's a hex. <laughs> this one's Dragonfly Tattoo. I know that. Uh, I'm not going to try to find all the colors for you. Some of them I know, some of them I don't. Isn't this one gorgeous? Oh my goodness. That one's beautiful. That could be like blow fly or metallic fly or something like that. Uh, this one's alright. This one's alright. <laughs> Pink. This one's a nice deep turquoise. Here's an orange one. This one is Black Witch Moth. It's one of the only self-striping colorways or stripey colorways she did versus variegated, and I think it came out really fun in the hex. Like, it's kind of stripey. 
And here's the last one in that pattern. Uh, so basically there are six patterns or seven patterns and um, you do 10 hexes, I believe, in each one. So then you end up with something like 70 hexes at the end. Uh, let me hold up my favorite. So I think this one is my favorite of this kind, of this hex. I think this is my favorite yarn. Although, no, that's my favorite in the other one. Uh, so I finished that hex and then started on the next one. This is the second hex. It's much more granny square than the first. So I don't think I like the pattern quite as much. Although in terms of actually crocheting it, I like it a lot. Um, so there's that one. Uh, but the, the yarn I used ended up being absolutely gorgeous and making even this pattern look fantastic. Like this one. I love this one. And I love this one. This one is so pretty. I don't know what colorway it is. There's this kind of green one with a little bit of brown in it, which I like. And this one is Grouchy Ladybug. I believe I used this colorway to knit something else at some point. Um, I actually really like this one, even though it's kind of orange and pink. Uh, I don't know. I just like this one. I like the color combination. So uh, that's what I have so far, these 15 hexes. And hence the title, Addicted to Crochet Hexagons. I just can't stop crocheting them. <laughs> They are so much fun and so satisfying. So, uh, yeah, so other colors we have in here Feathered Thorn Moth, that was the green one, Very Hungry Caterpillar, um, Dragonfly Tattoo, I told you about, Blowfly, that was the one I really liked. Blowfly. This one is below fly. Yeah, so lots of different colors and just something different to mix it up. I think it's been a while since I told you about hexes, so <laughs> maybe that should be the title. It's been a while since I told you about hexes. But yeah, I'm enjoying that. Um, all right, and then I am spinning, and um, I'm spinning uh, a colorway on my wheel. I didn't bring the little label in for you, um, so I can't show it to you. Uh, but I'm spinning uh, a Superwash Merino um, from Into the World on my wheel. Um, I was going to spin Long Drawn next, but then I switched to spinning Sock Yarn. I don't know. Don't ask me. <laughs> so I'm spinning sack yarn. Um, and it's really hard to spin merino. And I'm not sure if I like it. But it is coming out really thin. And I did kind of get a groove and I figured it out. So I think it's going to be okay. I think it's going to be pretty when it's done. All right. So that is um, my spinning on my wheel. Um, but toward de fleece has started. And so I started spindle spinning as well. Uh, this spindle I bought at uh, Maryland's Sheep and Wool, and so um, and it's a Bosworth, and so I decided to spin some Into the World on it. Um, I'm spinning BFL because I find BFL to be incredibly easy to draft, and so I just wanted to keep it really simple and easy on the spindle, and it's coming out really nicely. I'm really enjoying it. Um, just doing like a bit of drop spinning, a bit of sitting on my wheel, and then, you know, going back and crocheting. Um, so I'm kind of just moving all around. This colorway is Eureka, and it's from March 2015 of the club. So that is what's on my big spindle. I have a smaller, I have a um, also an Into the World BFL on my smaller spindle, but I didn't bring that in to show you. I'll show you that eventually. So I'm just spinning and crocheting, basically, <laughs> is what I've been doing these days. Uh, so that is it for drafting. On to fully drafted. I did finish something. Um, 
<laughs> this is uh, the first thing. I spun this from the fold, so it's like super lofty and squeezy. <laughs> um, and it's thick, although I didn't measure the wraps per inch yet. I think I was going to just wait until I actually washed it in order to do that. Um, but it is, it is like bulk. <laughs> it is very lofty. It is really different than the other yarn I've spun. And I like that. I don't know if I really liked spinning from the fold and if I'll do it again. <laughs> but um, I, did, I do really like this product and we'll see how it knits up. Um, this is, uh, the colorway is Flounce and the, uh, the yarn is uh, Coradale. And I got 182 yards. Here's my little label. And uh, here is the other side. I've been taking the stickers and sticking them over here. So Flounce is the December 2014 colorway from Into the World. So, yeah, I think it's great. I, I really like it. Alrighty, uh, so that's it for Fully Drafted. So, on to Lit Review, because I finished reading some stuff, and so I wanted to tell you about it. Um, and, finished reading two books, in fact, and started two new books. So, it's been very busy over here. Um, in fact, actually, I'm recording a week late because... We had a bit of a flood situation in our basement this week, which is not at all fun. And um, I have been busily dealing with that situation and thus not really having time for uh, recording. I had written my show notes um, to record on Saturday and then we woke up to a flooded basement. And so we spent all day on 4th of July, which is an American holiday for you as independents. Um, anyway, we spent all of that day cleaning the basement. <laughs> That's what we did on 4th of July. Uh, so needless to say, it's bit, been a bit of an interesting time over here. Um, but hopefully the basement situation is mostly taken care of at this point. Um, anywho, I did finish two books. So the first book was Boys Don't Knit in Public by T.S. Easton. And I know I told you about this book when I started it. Um, I My review of this book is I really enjoyed it. It was a lovely, light little book. Um, young adults, uh, fun read. It was really fun to read something comical from the perspective of a male protagonist in the young adult lit uh, genre because typically I've been reading uh, post-apocalyptic kinds of books in the young adult lit genre so um, I guess young adult lit's not a genre but whatever you get the idea category perhaps um, and so anyway I, I just I loved reading this um, it had really delightful characters it had really neat little knitting bits in it uh, for knitters to enjoy. It's kind of like little secrets that we would only get. Um, and that was kind of cool. So I gave it three uh, stars on Goodreads. I liked it. It wasn't the best book I ever read. I'm really glad I read it. I really enjoyed it. Um, here are some of my favorite quotes. The first rule of Knit Club is nobody talks about Knit Club. The second rule of Knit Club is no fair isle sweaters. What a good rule. <laughs> All right, here's another quote. In Knitting Club last night, Mrs. Hooper showed us how to design a pattern and how to write it in such a way that it can be followed by others. It's a little like machine code, a programming language. The girls looked a little blank. They're not a, a, they're not a bunch of total nerds like I am. So it was kind of cool, like this guy, you know, he's the only boy there. He's sort of finding, um, knitting to be similar to things that he would be interested in, uh, things that we typically consider masculine, like programming. I don't know. I don't know why we consider programming masculine. It's a very interesting social construction. Anywho, 
<laughs> um, so he's finding it to be kind of like that and he's really getting into sort of the nerdy aspects of knitting which I think is super cool. Um, another quote and this is what happens when I'm knitting I stop worrying about everything else only the next stitch matters and yet even then I need to have that complete pattern in the back of my mind I need to know there is a pattern. I love this quote this was kind of like uh, bringing out to me the aspects of knitting that you know he's finding comforting and I just thought that was really neat um, that this kid was finding knitting to be a comfort to him to be a Zen to be something that you know adds order to his somewhat chaotic life um, I know I mentioned this when I first talked about the book, but basically he ends up taking a knitting class because he's on probation. Um, and he just uh, really gets his life together <laughs> and knitting uh, comes to accept knitting as something he enjoys and is a part of his life. So that's really neat. Um, last quote, and I like this especially because this is a knitting podcast. Uh, he talks about knitting podcasts in this book, which is super neat. He said, anyway, the big news is that the Knitwits podcast girls are here. I'm starstruck. I saw them interviewing someone earlier. Must try and work up the courage to go introduce myself. Maybe they'll interview me. Isn't that cool? So he loved podcasts. He listened to podcasts all the time, knitting podcasts and... Uh, when he met these podcasters, he was nervous. <laughs> um, I don't know if you can relate to that. I can relate to that from meeting some of my favorite podcasters and feeling like, oh my gosh, they're so awesome. Um, but they did end up interviewing him, and that was super cool. So, um, what a great little book, Boys Don't Knit in Public. Uh, give it, look it up if you're interested in reading it. Um, so that was my young adult fiction. So uh, since I finished that, I am on to the next young adult book. I'm reading Little Brother by Cory Doctorow, uh, which is also young adult, and it is Juniata's uh, summer read. Juniata has a summer reading program uh, for everybody in the college for the summer, for every summer, and um, it's especially for incoming freshmen, um, but it really is for everybody. I assigned uh, summer reading in one of my courses that was not for freshmen last year. So, um, and uh, Little Brother um, is our summer read for 2015. So, I got started on that. A lot of the book seems to be themed around surveillance, which is super cool, and I'm really enjoying it. Uh, surveillance technology, stuff like that. So, um, so that's the young adult fiction category. I also finished reading on audiobook Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie and I ended up giving this book four stars on Goodreads. I really loved this book um, up until like the last few hours. I really loved it. So if it had been able to keep that momentum I think I would have given it five stars and I think um, I'd probably give it four and a half stars if I could do half stars for this book. Um, what I especially loved about this book um, were the parts from the main female protagonist's perspective, Ifa Melu. Um, I really liked her perspective. I really liked hearing her thoughts about uh, race in America and also the stuff that she wrote on her blog about race. So, um, yeah, I think this is a wonderful book. If you're interested in any of these themes, I think this is a great book for you to read. Um, you'll probably really like it. Um, up next on audio, which I already started, <laughs> The Bone Clocks by David Mitchell. Um, and this book is our July Club book. Um, and so, so far, um, I'm about two hours into it actually, but it's kind of a long book. It's like 24 hours long, so it'll take me a while to read it, but I am liking it so far. Um, all right, so on to the next segment, which is, um, our summer reading. Uh, it's called Summer Reading, and we are doing a read-along in the Ravelry group for the book Quiet by Susan Cain. And for this week, we were reading Chapter 3, When Collaboration Kills Creativity. And I finished this chapter today. 
<laughs> so I wanted to make sure we got a segment in to talk about it. And um, in redoing the schedule, I think what we'll do is read part two in July. So I will put up a schedule for reading part two. Um, and every time I podcast, I'll just do a couple of questions related to it, and then we can talk about it in the uh, Ravelry group. So um, my question for this um, chapter is what success or failure or what successes or failures have you had working in groups and working alone? So um, this chapter is very much about <laughs> uh, in her typical polarizing binary way that Susan Cain has, how people can have success working alone and what failures they can have working with others. However, I think um, I would stray away from that binary because for certain she says things in the chapter that I don't agree with. Um, and I think um, it was kind of interesting just to reflect on some of the successes and failures I've had in my life uh, in both working in groups and working alone. So, um, and, and there are a few quotes that I could certainly read to you here, um, but I thought I would focus on one particular part which kind of reminded me of Ravelry and something that she said that I think is really um, interesting in terms of, she says that collaboration can work, but not if it's person in face-to-face. She said that collaboration works better if it's uh, distance and over electronic media. So uh, this is one thing she says um, that reminded me of Ravelry. The Internet's role in promoting face-to-face -face group work is especially ironic because the early web was a medium that enabled bands of often introverted individualists, people much like the solitude craving thought leaders Farrell and Kronberg describe, to come together to subvert and transcend the usual ways of problem solving. Um, this to me seemed just like Ravelry, not to say that everybody on Ravelry is an introvert because certainly that is not the case. Um, and extroverted people can totally love networking with people electronically and, you know, digital social networking is a part of uh, many of our lives, and especially if you're watching this podcast, most likely a part of your life, right? Um, and so I don't think that's a binary thing, but I do think it is really interesting to think about um, knitting and how knitting used to be before Ravelry. Um, it used to be very much either you, you knit alone in your home and you kind of taught yourself and that's what you did, or you perhaps went to local meetup groups um, in your area, maybe like in your church, in the local yarn store, um, something like that. And, and you would learn to knit taking a class or for person to person, face to face, right? So those were your two choices, uh, face to face or alone, learning alone with a book. I learned how to knit before Ravelry, and I did it alone with a book in my house. <laughs> so, um, and I don't think my knitting was particularly good until um, I found, um, I had other friends that were knitters, and we kind of taught each other, like, the knitting I did on my own was not as good as the knitting I did when I was working with other people. Which is interesting, because knitting really is solitary and not at the same time. So um, we learn a lot from each other. We learn a lot from coming together. We learn a lot from community, but we still just do it ourselves. Like uh, there's very rarely a project where you would knit and somebody else would knit on the same project and it never happens at the same time. It's not like uh, other activities where you, you know, you might knit a row and then you give it to somebody else, right? It never happens at the same time. So I just thought that was really interesting, uh, a really interesting idea. So I wanted to answer the question to uh, what successes or failures have you had working in groups and working alone? Um, I found in working in groups a lot of success, but I think... Um, there have been times where I haven't found success working in groups, and I would say, um, like, some group projects I did in graduate school, especially, where there were undergrads in the class, 
Um, I, I remember this specifically my first semester in grad school. I had a class where I did a group project with some undergrads and um, I like they just didn't get it. Like they didn't get what I would want to do with it or what I was imagining we could possibly do with the project. And so it was just very limited what we did end up doing. Um, and I suppose if I had worked alone on that project, it would have been very different and it would have been something I would have, um, I think, been able to do more with. Um, so I think when you have group members that have different goals, that can be really challenging. Um, and that's one case of that. However, when I have collaborated with colleagues and I've actually, um, I have, I would say somewhere around four published pieces at this point, and uh, three of them were collaborative, and one was just me. So um, I really like writing with other people, and I really like researching with other people. Um, and uh, she talks about, again, how professors, or um, what does she call it? The same is true of academic research. Professors who work together electronically from different physical locations tend to produce research that is more influential than those either working alone or collaborating face-to-face. -face. I don't agree with that. I think um, it's, it's professors or maybe researchers who work alone and then work together. It's not the electronic media that makes that um, the way it as successful or productive. I think it's when you work really well alone and then when you come together and work really well together. And I think those are the kinds of collaborations that have been the best for me, uh, where we're both kind of on the same page and, um, oh, hi Lilith. We're both kind of on the same page and we're both kind of writing our parts and editing our parts and, um, thinking through our parts, and then also thinking about the project as a whole. Um, and I found those to be really successful and really fun projects to work on. I actually really enjoy collaborating with my colleagues, um, and I think we've done really interesting stuff. Uh, one example of this is the, um, the interview piece um, about Ravelry that I did with my uh, friend and colleague Amber Buck um, that I told you about on the podcast. And uh, this is an example of that. I kind of did the interviewee bits, the um, recording bits, and she did a lot of the theory, and we kind of put those two pieces together um, and had them kind of talk to each other. And I think that piece was particularly successful for those reasons. Um, so I, uh, I also like to work alone. Um, I don't prefer publishing and researching alone, um, but I like there to be times when I'm just doing my own work um, as part of, well, I guess I don't mind publishing and researching alone. I, I think I enjoy it more when I do it with other people, but um, anyway, there still needs to be a time where I go work on my own and then come back to it. Um, the times that I have not been as successful working alone have been the times when um, deadlines were sort of gray, <laughs> blurry, and I wasn't sure when they were, and so um, I have a harder time getting something done if I don't have an actual deadline for it. So the way that I finish my dissertation, which is not an easy thing to do, <laughs> um, if you've ever tried to write one, is that I would make appointments to go meet with other people to talk to them about my writing, um, because that actually got me to write. <laughs> uh, and so, and then at the end, I finished it really quickly because I had a job, and so I needed to get my dissertation done and defended and get that PhD finished so that I could start my job. Um, so it was kind of like I made deadlines, and those deadlines had some accountability to them. Like, I was actually meeting with other people face-to-face -face where I felt like I really needed to produce in order to, you know, um, have that meeting be successful. All right, so uh, that's my bit on success and failure. The only other thing I wanted to say, uh, she, she tells, Kane talks about writing this book, in fact, and how 
Um, she could work really successfully in places like coffee shops. Um, and uh, maybe even more so in a coffee shop with these little bit of um, interactions than she could at home. And one thing I found interesting about this, and something I've learned, or I'm learning about myself, because um, I, I now live in a small town. I grew up in a city. I grew up in Philadelphia. But I now live in Huntington, Pennsylvania, which is a small town. Um, so I've had to adjust to um, living in a place that's very different um, with a smaller community and people, everybody knows you. Um, where in Philadelphia, I had so much anonymity. Like, I could walk around, I could go to coffee shops. I, you know, I, I could be a lot of different places and nobody would know me. <laughs> or one person might know me. Uh, so now if I try to work in the coffee shop in Huntington, which I love the coffee shop in Huntington, I, I often have lunch with friends there. They have some food at the, the coffee shop, and it's one of my favorite places to be. But often when I'm there, I'm there with another person. And when I try to work there alone, I have a hard time working there alone because I'll see all these people I know that I want to talk to um, who will come say hello to me. And it's not that I necessarily mind that, but I don't find that particularly productive. Um, I miss the anonymity of an urban space quite a bit. Um, and I don't know if that's the introvert in me, but it might be the introvert in me because I need that space. Uh, I need time to think. I need some quiet in order to come back to the interaction. For me, um, I need that to recharge for the interaction. So anyway, those are my thoughts on um, working in groups and working alone. I would love to hear your thoughts, so please go ahead and post them in the Ravelry board. Um, all right, so I don't have a five favorite things segment for you today. Uh, I want to say about Noteworthy really quickly here um, that SSK is coming soon. In fact, it's next week. I might record while I'm there, but I know I won't post it until the week after, um, after I get back. So, um, so I'm posting this week, and then I'll post again in two more weeks. So that's about it. Have a great couple of weeks. I'll see you soon. I can't wait to come back and report to you from SSK. And don't forget, wherever you travel, bring your knitting along and engage your creative process.